All right. Well, hello, everyone. This is a short online lecture to introduce us to the HIP complex. And this is really focused on Chapter 10 of the Lavangi and Norkin textbook. So a lot of the materials are going to come from there, including some of the pictures that we're going to use. As we start talking about the HIP, uh, it does have some other names that I just want to mention. So Coxo femoral or coxofemoral is something we can use sometimes to describe the hip. And then another term that's also used is femoroacetabular. Obviously for the femoral head as part of the femur or the distal surface of the joint and that joins the proximal portion of the joint, the acetabulum. Sometimes combined, we refer to this as the F A joint and then some conditions that could happen here you could have an fa arthritis or another condition that commonly happens is we have an fai or femoroacetabular impingement and there's another online lecture that's going to focus on that but this is the quick intro for uh, the hip so let's get going on to the next slide So before we talk about the biomechanics of the hip, let's just talk a little bit about some of the anatomy and anatomical contributions to the hip movements. You'll notice that in this chart, which is at the beginning of all the chapters in the Banji, they start with the primary muscles. So for sagittal plane, for your flexion and extension, you have the iliopsoas, combination of the iliacus and psoas major that contribute to hip flexion. And those muscles on each side, are the primary contributors to flexion. And then that's countered by a very strong muscle, gluteus maximus, which has a large amount of force that it is able to produce. Now, consequently, you also have some secondary muscles uh, within these areas, which are still strong muscles, but don't contribute as much to the forces there. And you could look through the, the different sections in frontal plane, what are the contributors, and in transverse plane, what are the contributors. But one of the really unique things about the hip occurs with medial rotation, or I should say the lack of muscles that contribute to medial rotation. So if you notice here, there are no primary muscles that contribute to medial rotation. And so you might ask yourself, why is that? Why does the body not have these main primary movers contributed to internal rotation of the hips? Part of that lies into the biomechanics. Because if you think about the way we're positioned. All right, so I just have a little picture here to emphasize the, the positioning of us. Let me zoom in on this. So this is a test we typically refer to as the drop test. And so what you're going to do is you're going to have the subject stand on some type of platform. And there's various heights for this. Uh, typically, we'd like to see an athlete get maybe an 8, 10, 12 inch platform and then drop down. And so they work on the landing mechanics. So if you notice, when we jump off of a step or platform as we work on our landing, our feet are apart, which makes sense. We want a nice wide base of support to land. Uh, and what happens typically, if you think about the force of gravity and how that's going to position it straight down, if our feet are wider than our hips, and so if you can look at that, that alignment there, our feet are often wider than our hips, which makes our knees go inwards or in what we would ca call a valgus positioning. And along with that adduction that occurs, we're also getting a medial rotation. So both of these are occurring as an individual lands down naturally because of the effect of gravity and the shape of our bones and relative to one another. So naturally, our body needs to counteract this effect by doing abduction and external rotation. And so if you look at our, our muscles over here, we have strong muscles that do lateral rotation, such as our gluteus maximus, one of the largest muscles in most people's lower extremities in order to do that. And that's helping to bring 
our legs outwards. And then you see you have the gluteus medius, also a contributor to that, but other muscles to contribute to the opposite effect for lateral rotation and abduction. So that's one of the reasons why our body doesn't necessarily have a lot of muscles that contribute to the medial rotation. And consequently, in physical therapy, we don't spend that much time strengthening the internal rotators. Where do we spend a lot of time and where do we find a lot of weakness in our individuals? That's going to be over here with a lot of weaknesses with lateral rotation or external rotation, along with a lot of weaknesses with abduction, which is why we focus on the glutes a lot. And we'll mention that more in some lab and other activities. So hopefully that provides a, a nice overview, but it's always good to look at these muscles in relation to the biomechanics. Then just like we've looked at other joints throughout the body, our joints do have this biomechanical balance within them between the areas of mobility and stability. And we're constantly trying to alternate that back and forth. And if one joint has a decrease in mobility, that's going to require other joints to add more stability for that and vice versa. When we look at the hip in particular, you'll notice that that's a, a mobility joint, which means that if you don't have mobility in the hip, typically there's going to be a problem at the knee because now the knee is being forced to provide more stability or the lumbar spine. So just like we've mentioned before, you need proximal stability for distal mobility. And that's important to have a nice balance within our body so that we can perform at a high level. So let's talk a little bit about the structure and the bony shape at the hip joint. You can see here that you have the acetabulum, which is the concavity that allows the femoral head to pair into it. It's very analogous to at the shoulder. You have the glenoid fossa, which allows for the humeral head. So that portion makes up the socket of the ball and socket joint. In addition to that, we have the pelvis. And so the acetabulum is really part of the entire pelvis. And the pelvis is made up of three different bones. So you have the ilium, uh, which is pictured up here in this section. And then you have consequently the crest of that. So we call that the iliac crest. And then we have portions anterior and posterior to that as well. Next up, you have the ischium. And here's the ischium. And when we think about the ischium, a lot of times we think about the very end of that, the ischial tuberosities, which is where the hamstring muscles are going to originate, of course. And then finally, we have the pubis bone. And so when we think about that portion, typically we think about the pubic symphysis, which is connecting the left and right pelvis, pelvic bones together via the fibrocardinogenous disc together. And so that is the overall structure of the pelvis. And even though it's joined here into the femoral head, uh, we do know that on the other portion, it is joined to the sacrum, and that's what forms that sacroiliac joint and provides a lot of stability for our body. Now, in terms of the acetabulum, you can see a, a better picture uh, of that here and this acetabulum. Um, you could see that it's not quite oriented exactly flat Against, against what a wall would be or something else, there is a slight angulation to it. It's difficult to tell in this picture. But inferiorly, it's pointed at approximately 50 degrees to allow for the direction of the femoral head to come in, which is obviously oriented superiorly. And then it's also rotated towards the front, or what we call an antiversion, by approximately... 20 degrees. The normal range on this is typically 15 to 20 degrees. 
with females having uh, typically a little bit more antiversion or more opening of the hips than, than males typically do. However, there's a lot of variations on this and a lot of this is somewhat determined during our early years as we start to bear weight and the positions that we sit, crawl, and function in may help to form the shape and the direction of our acetabulum.